Hello, boys and girls, and welcome to another episode of Movie Goodness, where we examine life through cinema here on the KB Radio Network. How are we doing, everybody? It is Scream Day. We're going to scream all day. Now, I'm not going to scream into the microphone for this entire episode. No, 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 no. We're not talking that type of scream. We're talking the franchise known as Scream. Uh, this is all, of course, in commemoration of the latest release that is dropping in theaters this weekend, Scream 6. We're going to go through the entire Scream franchise, which is a very prominent horror franchise i I dare to say um you go back in 19 what was it 96 never never would you have thought that this would turn into a juggernaut of a franchise like it has and man i am i am look i was burnt out on stream i would say maybe the third one i think that came out in 2000 and I'm, I just got tired of the ghost face. I got, to, <laughs> I said enough was enough. Uh, they, the film started to, well, the film started to decrease in quality to a degree. So it, it kind of, I, I was kind of stepping back from the uh, screen franchise. And I, I did watch them all. Uh, they even had a TV show. Um, I didn't watch much of that TV show. But last year, in 2022, they reinvented this franchise in a sense. No, they didn't reboot it. They didn't remake it, even though it has the exact same name as the film from 1996. But this was like a fresh, new sign of life into this franchise, which I must say got me excited for this upcoming installment, Scream 6 which is released on March the 10th in theaters this year. Uh, I should say today at uh, the time of this episode's release or one day this week. Um, I don't know when I'm released this episode. I'm be honest with you. I'm recording this like a month out, (laughs) but I I knew that, uh, I knew that we were going to talk about this. So what we're going to do today, we're going to go through the first five screen films because haven't seen the six yet of course so we're gonna rank them or should i say grade them we're we're gonna uh review them Uh, i'm not gonna rank them i'm not gonna go uh uh one through five what's the best what's the worst what you could you could determine that by the grades Uh, (laughs) i know normally that's what i do for other franchises that i have reviewed but uh this go around we're just gonna break down each in every film and give it a grade like we do for our normal reviews. Uh, but uh, before we jump into the reviews of these films, uh, let's go through how this came to be. Scream was written by Kevin Williamson, who uh, is a very talented screenwriter, very talented, especially dealing with horror. Uh, he wrote several of the screen films uh uh i know what you did last summer uh halloween h2o cursed um what else he did i think uh dawson dawson creek to get out of the horror genre of it all you know the vampire diaries and so on and so forth he he he's has it you know he has had his hands in a lot of pop culture of the last 30 years, I guess you could say. And he initially conceived this under the title of scary movie. That's when he wrote this screenplay. And we all, we know scary movie as the Marlon Wayans, uh, or the Wayans brothers films (laughs) that came out. That was actually parroting these films here. And, um, they both were distributed by, uh, dimension films. Uh, oddly enough, but that's a whole nother story. But uh, uh, they decided to change the name and change it to Scream. But uh, he wrote this. He wrote it as a 18-page strip uh, inspired by a series of murders in Gainesville uh, that 
Williamson had seen in a news story and his own experience alone at a friend's house. He was house sitting and he had discovered an open window. He had previously not noticed open, you know, he, he didn't, he didn't realize that that this window was open. So that, that was the inspiration for this franchise. Uh, the treatment covered what would become the opening scene of Scream, which we all know as uh, Drew Barrymore's scene in Scream. Uh, Kevin Williamson wrote this uh, screenplay for Scream in three days. He wrote it in three days and he brought it to his agent and it actually started a bidding, bidding war. It was submitted on a Friday and by Monday morning, I think several studios, I know Paramount, Universal, uh, Dimension, um, and there were some others that were vying for this screenplay uh, to produce it. Um, accompanying the script were two five-page outlines for potential sequels for the film. Uh, Williams had hoped to provide added incentive to, you know, by the screenplay, you know, if, if, if you set up a franchise already, like, okay, we have ready made sequels for this already. And, um, it helped, it worked. Uh, Williams later, uh, claimed that he wrote the screenplay partly because it was a film he wanted to watch and nobody else is making it. Uh, the script was very self-aware and the characters in the screenplay were fully acknowledging the tropes of the genre of the horror genre, you know, all of the cliches of horror films, which Williams Williamson had claimed expired him, it, you know, like Halloween and uh, Nightmare on Elm Street and uh, Friday the 13th and so on and so forth. Uh, Williamson was told early by his agent that the, uh, saturation of violence and gore in his script would make it impossible to sell and following his purchase to Miramax he was required to remove much of the glory uh, gory scenes however once Wes Craven was confirmed to direct he was able to bring much of that gore back um Williamson intended to remove a scene in the film that took place inside a fictional school bathroom, feeling that it was awkward. But Russ Craven uh, believed it was poignant. So uh, Kevin Williamson later confirmed that he was glad Ray, uh, Wes Craven did so. The death of the character Principal Hembert was added at the request of the producer, Bob Weinstein, who noted that there was 30 pages, 30 on-screen minutes, without a death. <laughs> so this later uh, aided Williamson, who was struggling to find motivation for characters to leave the party in the film's finale, now able to use and discover co the, the corpse of the principal's character. While writing the finale, Williamson was unsure what to cite as a motivation for the killers or whether to give them one at all. Opinions were split between staff on the picture, some who felt that a motive was necessary for the audience to be given resolution, while others felt it was scarier without one. Ultimately, Kevin Williamson decided to do both. Given the character Billy Loomis, the motive of maternal abandonment, while not giving the character Stu one. Instead, having the character jokingly suggest peer pressure. <laughs> now, I mentioned that Wes Craven was the director of the first four of these films. Uh, he came on. But do you know that early on during the bidding process of the of the op of the first script of Scream, Oliver Stone, Oliver Stone, you know, Platoon. Born on the 4th of July, <laughs> yeah, JFK, yeah, that Oliver Stone. He was all in on this script. He wanted this. He wanted to direct this in the worst way. 
um, he was working with one of the studios to try to get the rights to this uh, screenplay, but lost out. And that, you know, this is one of those things you you look back and say, hmm, what if? <laughs> what if? You know, I don't see Oliver Stone making a slasher film. It that just does it just doesn't compute with me. It just doesn't register. But hey, it could have been the greatest thing ever. I don't know. But uh he wasn't the only one. Um, like I said, Wes Craven early on, uh he really wasn't too keen on directing this. Uh he wasn't the first choice. There were others. Uh we had Robert Rodriguez was one of the names thrown out there. Danny Boyle was a name. George Romero and Sam Remy. Uh, they were approached to direct Scream. Um, but as we say, the rest is history. Wes Craven, I guess he decided, you know what? Let me go ahead on and get it done. And boy, did he get it done. The franchise has gone on to gross over $700 million worldwide. And it is one of the most profitable horror franchises ever. Um, Russ Craven directed the first four, whereas Matt Olpin and Tyler uh, Gillett directed the previous two, the Scream and the upcoming Scream 6. The first four films follow Sidney Prescott and her struggle against a succession of murderers who adapt the guise of Ghostface to stalk and kill their victims. The killers often being motivated by revenge, jealousy, and seeking notoriety. Uh, Sydney receives support from the town policeman, Dooley Riley, uh, tabloid reporter, Gail Weathers, and film geeks, Randy Meeks and Kirby Reed, uh, along with various other friends, romantic partners, and acquaintances that change as the series progress. From the fifth film onward, the focus shifts to Billy Loomis's daughter, Samantha Carpenter, and her sister, Tara, who are targeted due to their connection to the original killers. Together with their friends and some of the original survivors, which include Sidney, Gail, Dewey, and Kirby, they must contend with new ghost face killers with motives that may sometimes be connected to the in-universe stab movies. So, this should be a good segue into our reviews. I mean, we have five reviews to get through today, so... No, no, no sense of dilly dallying around. Let's start it all off with the one that started it all back in 1996. I was in high school. <laughs> I think I was a se- well, I was senior. No, I was a junior in high school when this film came out and Scream. And look, the phenomenon surrounding this film. I, I I remember it like it was yesterday. It feels like it with so many coming out and with this one coming out, uh, the new one coming out now. It's like, man, it brings back so many memories. I remember when this film came out, uh, all the talk, all the... Because up to this point, slasher films have kind of died out as a subgenre in horror. You know, we didn't have... Not good ones. We didn't have too many good ones. You know, you still had your Nightmare on Elm Street film still hanging on by a thread. You had a a couple of Halloween movies hanging on by a thread, but they had diminished in quality years ago. And so the excitement behind a true blue horror slasher film was was gone. The the excitement was gone, you know, (laughs) but this was a fresh take on the genre this this reinvented the genre uh after scream just a, if you're old enough to remember just remember the 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 outpouring of other slasher films around that time especially dealing with teenage you had i know what you did last summer which has the same writer but you know you had uh uh urban legends and 
you know, just so many different versions. Not not all of them good. They actually a vast majority of them, a majority of them were bad, but <laughs> this is the one that kicked it all off and it gave us the scary movie franchise oddly enough being as though this was at one time called scary movie uh the working title of this film um we wouldn't have had that classic comedy film series which the only good ones were the first two that had the wayans brothers attached but after the wayan brothers left it it so did the laughs so it, it got bad after that but it all started in 1990 six scream directed by the great Wes Craven. You heard me mention his name millions of times throughout this show thus far. And in case you don't know who Wes Craven is, shame on you. Wes Craven is a horror film icon legend. Just a nightmare on Elm street. This, that was him. People under the stairs, uh, did he do the hills have eyes? I can't remember. I think he did do the hills have eyes, but uh, um, um, the last house on the left, uh, the serpent in the rainbow. The serpent in the rainbow was the film that, when I was younger, I think that movie came out in 80, 87, 88, somewhere up in there. That movie, I could not watch. I, I think to this date. I have not watched that movie from beginning to end. I have watched the whole movie, but I've watched it in pieces. <laughs> I have never sat down and watched that movie from beginning to end. Um, Serpent in the Rainbow, if you haven't seen it, check it out. And I'm speaking to myself, too, because I need to go. Back. I want to sit down and watch it from beginning to end one day. Uh, I just haven't built up the courage to do it yet. But he also had... Uh, a kind of a shocker and i didn't know this till later in life uh probably around the time when uh this film came out i want to say i was in high school or something when i realized that he directed the 1982 film swamp thing and i, I it blew my mind because i remember watching swamp thing when i was younger didn't know of course he wasn't Wes craven then you know what i'm saying <laughs> but it's just weird to see uh if you go back through a filmography of a, a actor or a filmmaker that you admire and see titles pop up that you didn't realize they were attached to is 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 amazing. But yeah, he did all that. But anyways, along with him directing, it was written by Kevin Williamson, as I said. And the film stars David Arquette, Ned Campbell, uh Courtney Cox, Matthew La uh Lauder. Uh, Rose McGowan, Skeet Urich, uh, Jamie Kennedy, and Drew Barrymore. And the film follows high school student Sydney Prescott, portrayed by Nev Campbell, and her group of friends in, a fish in the fictional town of Woodsboro, California, who becomes the target of a mysterious killer in a Halloween costume known as Ghostface. Um... The film is saturated with cliches of the slasher genre popularized in film by the 1978 film Halloween, um, Friday the 13th, and Russ Craven's own A Nightmare on Elm Street. Uh, Scream is considered unique at the time of its release for featuring characters aware of real-world horror films who openly discuss the cliches of the film's attempt to subvert um I, i'm i'm as i said before th this was a phenomenon when it came out um a lot of the people involved in this all the cast that i just named they were young at the time and didn't really know much of them or much about them should i say other than the, the biggest stars was i knew who david arquette was i knew who courtney cox was uh, the other cast members, I seen them in other things, but nothing that I was like, oh, wow, they were in it. Oh, man, they're in this. I got to go see it. But the biggest name, of course, was Drew Barrymore. And been watching her my whole life. <laughs> you know, my whole life. I mean, E.T., 
fire starter. You know, all the I've been following Drew Barrymore. And she's in this. And I'm like, all right, this is cool. Now that was the that was the name that drew me to this film. And ironically, for me to go sit in the theater and watch this, and the opening scene happens. And I'm like, wait, what is going on? <laughs> What is that? The biggest name on your marquee, or marquee rather, dies within the first five minutes of this film. <laughs> Her face is on the poster. She's in all the promotion materials and all the trailers and all this here. And she's dead in the first five minutes. And you're like, oh my God, this is crazy. Spoilers. I mean, this movie is 20 something years old. Get over it. If you haven't seen Scream by now, I don't know what to tell you. All these films have spoilers. So if you haven't seen none of the screams, uh, I'm spoiling them. I'm, <laughs> I mean, come on, man. Uh, but yeah, this is uh, this was wow back then. And that was all the talk. If you was into that, it, it, uh, you know, talking with your friends about movies that came, that came out and whatnot, like I was around my friends, it was a big thing. Well, a group of my friends. I had several clicks. You know, I had my friend film clicks that I would talk to. I had my sports clicks I would talk to. I had my comic book clicks because none of them, had, all of them didn't have the same interests. So I had to divvy up time in different clicks. But as any who's um, <laughs> high school people, you, you y'all know. Anyways, uh, yeah, I, that was mind blowing. And these young actors who I didn't know who they were at the time. And I say young, but they were older than me around that time by a couple of years. I, I was introduced and now, uh, you know, their mainstays in pop culture because of this film. This was well done, well written. The scares were there. Uh, the mystery was there because you didn't know who the killer was. You had an idea. You know, smart people now probably watch Scream for the first time and probably knew who the killer was early on. But back then, we didn't have all that, <laughs> so it wasn't it wasn't that obvious to film go uh, film uh, watchers around that time. You know what I'm saying? So I it really caught you off guard. It did for the real twist. You probably figured it out, but you didn't know it was two of them. Now, now, that was the big, that was like a one, a literal one, two punch. You know, if you did figure out it was Billy Loomis, like, okay, cool. But then they hit you with that swerve that Stu was helping. And you're like, oh my God, this is, <laughs> this is brilliant. I did not see that coming. And look, man, around that time, I don't know anybody in my little circle that knew that was coming. Nobody saw that coming. I did <laughs> And nobody saw that coming. It was so well done. And it, it was smart to have the character of Randy Meeks, who is a horror film fanatic, uh, uh, knows all the tropes of the horror genre and is able to kind of guide you through this as, uh, 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 you know, as a unofficial narrator of horror films who, who's telling you everything that's, tra that's transpiring, you know, uh, uh, like, oh, you got to shoot him in the head. Oh, don't don't lose your virginity. You know, and stuff, you know, the typical horror tropes. And it turns the horror genre on his head. And I think, in a way, as brilliant as this was, and how much this reinvented the, I don't know if reinvent is the right term, but uh, for what it did to the horror um, genre, it also helped. I mean, uh, it helped it and hurt it. It, it hurt it in a way because now all horror films got to be smart. You, you you just can't have a killer just flipping out and killing people. Now it, it's all fine and good, but that's not what audiences want anymore. You know, they, they want these smart uh, psychological thriller type horror films. Now, you know, uh, going by the box. So I'm just going by how the audience responds to certain horror films. You know, you can't have Freddy Krueger just, terrorizing your dream dreams he has to have a backstory now you know you can't have jason Voorhees just hopping out of a lake and chopping your head off with a machete you gotta have a backstory oh you know of 
what happened to Jason when he was a little baby child, you know, stuff like that, <laughs> you know, and, and it hurt it in a way because me personally, as a fan of horror, I don't need a backstory. I don't need a motivation. I don't, I don't need the killer to have a motivation. Some people are just sick in the head and there you have it, <laughs> you know, and in this film, you, you see that, uh, uh, Billy Loomis was motivated. He had, he was seeking revenge, whereas Stu, he was just sick in the head. You know, <laughs> you had both sides of the coin. You know, you had one with, mo- with a motive and one didn't have a motive. But uh, that's all that. All that aside, all that aside, this was an awesome, awesome slasher film. And uh, before I get the grade, it was also nice. Is one of those blink and you miss it cameos when it was at school in the janitor who was, uh, <laughs> I think he was mopping or sweeping in the hallway or something. And he had on the green and red sweater, the same as Freddy Krueger. And his name was Fred. It's <laughs> the janitor that is played by Wes Craven. Wes Craven played Fred, the janitor in the, in that little blinking, you miss it cameo which was funny in so many levels because he had on the same sweater as Freddy Krueger, the character he created. And I thought that was a beautiful nod to, uh, <laughs> to Wes Craven, uh, by Wes Craven. I guess it was a, a, a self glossing moment, but he earned it for that, <laughs> for giving us that gem of a nightmare on Elm street, but scream from 1996 gets a letter grade of a B plus, um, really, really good horror film that launched a juggernaut of a franchise. We fast forward to 1997. Yes. The following year we get the sequel scream Two. Um, these were fast tracked. They cheap. They are cheap to make. They, they're, they're cheap films to make. And I'm not saying cheap as if they're bad films. I mean, they were inexpensive. Uh, the first screen was made for, what, $14 million, and it ended up grossing $173 million. So that, that's what I mean by cheap. You can make these fairly for nothing and and get better results. Now, the budget for this film, Scream 2, it was doubled. Um, well, not doubled, but it, I, this film was made for $24 million, and it gro- end up grossing a hundred and seventy two million, uh, just one million short of his predecessor. But yet and still a success, nonetheless. Uh, Scream Two is a nineteen ninety seven American slasher film, again directed by Wes Craven and written by Kevin Williamson. It again stars David Arquette, Nev Campbell, Courtney Cox, Cheryl Michelle Geller. Jamie Kennedy, uh, Jerry O'Connell, Elise Neal, Timothy Oliphant, Jada Pickett, and Liv Schreiber. Even though this film came out a year after the first one, uh, the sequel is set two years after the first film. And again, follows the character of Sidney Prescott portrayed uh, once again by Nev Campbell and other survivors of the West Bros Massacre at a fictional college in Ohio where they are targeted by a copycat killer using the guise of Ghostface. Like its predecessor, Scream 2 combines the violence of a slash of the slasher genre with elements of comedy, satire, and whodunit mystery while sanitizing the cliches of film sequels. And once again, the brilliant, brilliant story how the first stream dissected the horror genre cliches scream Two dissected the film sequels cliches. You know how in sequels, they got to do it bigger, better, or, you know, the kills are more Gloria. They're more, uh, uh fantastical and all this other stuff. It, it was poking fun yet again at sequels which is ironic because this film has five sequels. 
<laughs> but it and it was a sequel within itself. But it was funny how it can do it in a smart way. You know, it, it's done to poke fun, but at the same time, honor. You know what I'm saying? It, it wasn't doing it to like you ever seen like uh, these are films that I probably would never review on this show. <laughs> Uh, you know, a superhero movie and Meet the Spartans. You know those stupid parody movies they made <laughs> in the uh, for a pocket of time. It was like one every year. It, it was just dumb. But those were just dumb to make fun of movies. You know, there was no message in all this here or no point to those movies. It really was no point to those films. Uh, yeah, because it was done to make fun of. This wasn't done uh, to make fun of the genre it was just to turn it on his head in scream 2 we are introduced to the inner universe stab movie the movie within the movie uh this was a film that was based on the events of the woods bros uh, massacre so and this is a trope that runs throughout the rest of the scream films but stab begins at the uh, front of this film and we get our uh, first kill early on and this is where jada pickett is murdered and once again she wasn't the biggest name at that time so that really didn't shock but it was brutal uh her and omar epps i believe was uh, uh her bo- who played her boyfriend now his death was brutal in that bathroom <laughs> when he went to the theater to go see stab and um I like that scene for this reason and this reason only. It showed how, and I don't know if they did this on purpose, but this is how I read into it, that the world is just desensitized to violence. They're desensitized to what's going on around them. Um, While Jada Pickett is sitting in this theater, sitting next to this ghost face killer, getting stabbed up in the middle of this theater now, nobody is paying attention. Um, she crawls, she manages to get to the stage while the movie is playing. And I guess the audience thought this was like a publicity stunt or something. And <laughs> because she's in there bleeding, she's screaming for help and nobody, they just cheering on and she just drops dead right there on, on the stage. Uh, I was like, Oh my God, that's, that's the world in a nutshell. <laughs> that's us in a nutshell. We, we just look at things as. All right, whatever. Uh, let's see what this was. Ninety-seven. Yeah, we didn't have cell phones back then, so uh, or camera phones and all that there. So that would have been a uh, if that was made today. Yeah, everybody would have whipped out their camera phones and took pictures of. It. But um, <laughs> it just showed how desensitized the world is. And that's how we are. That's how we are. But uh, but Scream Two. It's not as good as the first one. Well, I'm going to give you a spoiler alert uh, for the rest of this show. None of the sequels, none of them are as good as the first one. Uh, they're good in their own right, but none of them live up to that first one. Scream 2 didn't have that same magic as the first one. Um, this was more of a psychological whodunit than a actual slasher horror film. Um it just did not have the same uh, tone, I guess is the proper term. It didn't have the same tone. It was more, who's the killer? That's what everybody was wondering throughout the whole film. It was it, none, It was nothing done to kind of scare you or shock you. It was more or less uh, like watching Knives Out or something, you know, trying to figure out who the killer was. And that's what these films had kind of turned into going forward. And it's no fault of the filmmakers. It's just that's that's what we're accustomed to now. We want to know who the killers are, you know, because there's a different killer in every film. And this one, um, I think, tried to get a little too cute with the <laughs> reveal of the killer. It was just kind of out of nowhere to me. And, and, and it just didn't have that same impact when we find out it was Billy Loomis and Stu from the first film, uh, we find out in this film that the killer was Billy Loomis's mother and, uh, a 
uh, Timmy Oldefant, uh, Timothy Oldefant's uh, character uh, helping her out. And she ends up betraying him and killing him. It, it was pretty much the same recycled formula from the first one. You know, <laughs> and it, it just done in a kind of different tweaked out way. But it was the same exact thing. Two killers, one being a Loomis uh, <laughs> and the other one just being a, the complete psychopath of it. You know, the brains and the brawn. That, 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 was, that was the formula. And it just didn't have the same impact. But other than that, the film was decent. It was good. Uh, it just didn't have that same flavor as the first. So Scream 2 from 1997 gets a letter grade of a C+. Plus. Now, let's mosey on to the year 2. Thousand. We we're we crossed over into a new century, and we have a new Scream feel. In the year, year two thousand, we get the release of Scream three once again, directed by Wes Craven. And this go around, uh, Kevin Williamson didn't write the screenplay. It was written by Ephraim Kruger, who's given us some real good, real good movies. He wrote the uh, the Ring, you know, the American remake of the Ring. He has the distinct honor of writing one of the best Transformers films, uh, Transformers Dark of the Moon, and one of the worst Transformers films, Transformers Age of Extinction. And so uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's safe to say his, his, his writing filmography is hit and miss. Well, this go around, returning to star in this film, of course, we have David Arquette, Nev, Nev Campbell, Courtney Cox, Parker Posley, uh, Patrick Dempsey, Scott Foley, Lance Hendrickson, um, Jenny McCarthy, and many, many more. Stream 3 takes place three years after the previous film's events and follows Sidney Prescott, once again portrayed by Nev Campbell, who has gone into uh, self-isolation following the events of the previous two films, but is drawn to Hollywood after a new ghost face begins killing the cast of the film within a film, Stab 3. Scream 3 combines the violence of the slasher genre with comedy and a whodunit mystery while satiring the cliche of the film trilogy. As you can tell, this is a trope. (laughs) This is a trope in the Scream franchise. It makes fun of fellow franchises. Uh... The first film made, uh, not made, I, I keep saying make fun, but just uh, uh, point out the cliches of its genre. Uh, the first one pointed out the slasher genre, the horror genre. Part two pointed out the sequels. Uh, and this one pointed out the trilogies in film. And as I mentioned before, this is when I started to kind of get off the train of the <laughs> of the stream franchise because they were trying too hard I felt um I, I let the I let part two go I, I I felt they were doing that in part two but I let it go because it was kind of innovative and smart but this go around they just they were pulling things out the hat to <laughs> try to make it um you know get that same impact as the first one. And overall, that's my biggest bugaboo with this franchise that it tried to just outdo the first one instead of just being your own. Sometimes you just got to set up, set aside all that and just be your own. And this failed with me. Uh, We find out that the killer who was portrayed by Scott Foley is the half brother of Sidney Prescott and you know it it was just so far-fetched we just where are these characters coming from and she didn't know nothing about nobody knew nothing about all this all this backstory and it was just like what 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 are we doing here we just pulling names out of a hat or whatever (laughs) and anybody's a killer you know what made what made part one so good was that yes it you have these killers, they killing these people. It wasn't so random as, uh, you know, looking from the outside in, it, it was all connected in a way, but still connected to Sidney Prescott. 
and they're all connected to Sidney Prescott. Don't get me wrong, but it's like they're just pulling people out of the blue, you know, <laughs> these family members that she didn't even know she had. And it was just these random connections that you didn't see coming. You know, it, it wasn't set up properly. I don't know. It, it just did not work for me. I, this this was the one, honestly, where I said they don't need to do it anymore. This is it. This is, <laughs> this was all, it was all right for what it was. Once again, I like that, uh, you know, they did something different. Now they're in Hollywood. The kills were innovative. I thought, uh, it was, it was, it was fine. It was fine, but I just didn't, I didn't like it. I did not like the ultimate end of this story and the reveal of this story. And it was a letdown. And honestly, it was a letdown. And Scream 3 from the year 2000 gets a letter grade of a C minus. It it really, it really, I, I was done after this. <laughs> and you could tell later on in it that the studios were kind of done with it as well. We move on to the year 2011. Yes, 11 years later. This was the biggest gap in the franchise uh, until you know, uh, the next one, but this was the first big gap reason being, cause this franchise was pretty much dead in the water after part three and rightfully so. But in 2011, they came up with a new idea and it wasn't bad. Actually it was kind of smart and we get stream four. this go around once again, returning in his last, addition to the Scream franchise due to his untimely demise a few years after the release of this film, Mr. Rest Craven. Uh, he directed uh, along with returning the writer and creator of this franchise, Kevin Williamson, ri- writing this screenplay starring in this film. We have Nev Campbell, David Arquette, Courtney Cox, Emily Roberts, uh, Hayden Pendenary, Anthony Anderson, Allison Bree, Adam Brody, Rory Calkin, and many, many more. Uh, the film takes place on the 15th anniversary of the original Rose Bros murder from Stream in 1996, uh, and it involves Sidney Prescott, once again portrayed by Nev Campbell, returning to the town after 10 years where Ghostface once again begins killing students at Woodbro's High. Like, like its predecessors, uh, Scream 4 combines the violence of the slasher genre with elements of black comedy and whodunit mystery and the cliches of film remakes. And this, this go around, we get the remake trope. And <laughs> I thought that was funny. The, the film also provides commentary on the uh, usage of social media and the obsession with internet fame. So it, it was an up to date version of stream. Uh, and I thought, I thought that was a nice touch to this franchise. We had to, we had to evolve with the times and this, this did a great job of doing so. Um, once again, I thought this was good. Didn't think it was as good as the first, of course. But it was definitely better than the last one. And I I enjoyed the elements they put in it, how they weaved in the social media presence of, of the time. Um, and this was, what, 12 years ago. So I can imagine, just imagine now with the gram and uh, <laughs> TikTok and all that there, which, hey, it could be a, it could be an element of, of this upcoming one. I don't know. We have to wait and see. But it was nice to see that, you know, and that's what made the original one so good. You know, we didn't have the cell phone, you know, when, when, when Ghostface was calling Sidney Prescott and all that, it was on a landline, you know, so most people don't even have landlines now. <laughs> you know, who has a house phone? I can't remember the last time I had a house phone, you know, we all have cell phones and stuff. You dig it. it and this was before, call ID really was a, a thing. So you didn't know where these phone calls was coming from and whatnot. But uh, 
if you was going to do it in this era, you had to find a different way to do it, you know, because like I said, you have ways to track people who are calling you on the phone or uh, DMing you and all this other stuff. So I thought that was smart. Um, the killer in here, this is where it falls apart for me. I did not care for the reveal of the killer because this go around. We find out it's Sidney Prescott's cousin. <laughs> so it was it was kind of like, uh. now what I did like about it is you didn't see it coming. At least I did. I did not see that coming. It was done well. It was done by the master, you know, Wes Craven. And I like that I, I had no clue this was coming. But after the reveal, you saw it. After, you know, you could go back and watch it now and you could see the clues of like, oh, yeah, yeah, it was her. It was her the whole time. But during the film, you didn't know. Now, there were part. Now, you can go back and watch it. Now, Sidney Prescott's cousin in this film is portrayed by Emma Roberts. Emma Roberts is, what, 20 pounds soaking wet. And some of the kills that, she, <laughs> that Ghostface makes in this film is like, it's no way. <laughs> There's no way she did that on her own. But, hey, once again, you got to suspend disbelief, and this is what we get. But uh, other than that, you know, it was all right. It was a fine addition into the Scream franchise. I look, I will go back and watch this one, unlike others. I can see myself going back and watch this one, even though I have it. But, uh... <laughs> It was it was pretty decent, and I give Scream 4 from the year 2011 a letter grade of a C plus. Real good addition, Um, and this was pretty much the end of Scream. At least I thought this was the end, and this, this was prior to the passing of Wes Craven, who passed away, I think, in 2015. Um, It was really no need. It, it was really no need. That was it. To be honest, Sidney Prescott's story was really wrapped up in the first. <laughs> we really milked that cow dry, but it, it it was it was fine for what they were doing. The second one was understandable, but after that, it kind of they they were just throwing stuff against the wall, seeing what stuck. And uh, I think this was a good way to kind of put a button on it. it especially you didn't want to leave a bad taste in your mouth after that third. That third one was the worst for me in this franchise. And uh, to come back and kind of right that wrong, they really did. Uh, introducing new characters, having uh, 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 new innovative innovative ways for Ghostface to do what he do. They did all that in here, and I really did enjoy it. And so I thought this was the end. But, oh, boy, was I wrong. We mosey on to the year of 2022. Yes, people, last year. And we get the kind of reinvention of the franchise, and that is none other than Scream. Yeah, <laughs> we get Scream. Not Scream 5, but Scream. And this go around, we have new additions, new, new directors, new uh, writers, and... Uh, new cast members who were kind of the focal points and uh, it, it, it was it was a fresh reboot if you will and of course in typical screen fashion that's exactly what this film was poking fun at the reboot I keep saying poking fun it wasn't poking fun per se it was just a, a, a way of shining a light on reboots and this film was directed by matt open and tyler gill gillett and uh it was written by james vanderbilt um the the two directors of this film were fresh off of the success of ready or not which was a surprise hit in a surprisingly great horror film i love that movie it stars uh, uh, Samara Reeving um, and so many others. I, I can't even remember who. But it, it was it was such a f 
fun, fun movie. I've watched it multiple times. I enjoyed it immensely. Uh, so when they took over this franchise, I was I was kind of like, okay, let's see let's see what we got here. Uh, let's see what's going on. Uh, what can they bring new? What can they do fresh? Because Ready or Not had elements of that stream, you know, like the the black comedy and uh, uh, the poking fun. I keep saying that. Well, I'm just going to stick with it. Fine. Um, poking fun <laughs> of the horror genre. And, okay, they can do this. They, I think they can do this. And, boy, did they. Uh, this was built as a relaunch of the franchise. And it, it, as you can say, it was a direct sequel to Scream 4. We do have returning cast members, uh, Nev Campbell, Courtney Cox, uh, David Arquette. And we have some new fresh members of this cast. Melissa Barrera, uh, Kyle Galler, uh, Mason Gooden, Mikey Madsen, uh, Jenna Ortega, Jack Quaid, uh, uh, it's it, so many more. But this was fresh. This was fresh. Um, yes, you had your returning characters, but they took more of a back seat. You know, your legacy characters. And this film takes place 25 years after the original Woods Bros murders in Scream from 1996. Yet another ghost face appears and begins targeting a group of teenagers who are each somehow linked to the original killings. And uh, like I said before, similar to the previous entry, Scream combines the violence of the slasher genre with the black comedy and the whodunit mystery, yet pointing out the cliches of reboots and leg legacy sequels. Uh, the film um, also provides commentary on the horror fandom culture, particularly the, the divide between elevated horror and classic slasher films. This was an awesome movie. I mean, completely took me off guard uh it's hard to reboot a beloved franchise i i have as, as y'all heard i have my kind of problems with some of the sequels in the screen franchise but overall i love this franchise and i was done after part four i didn't want to see no more but once they announced this and we have new directors, new cast, and all this here. I was mad. I was like, why are they they going to ruin it? <laughs> you know, I had already felt like it was kind of ruined in some sense. Like, we, we went as far as we could go with all this. But I didn't want them to poo-poo on the, the, the franchise. You know what I'm saying? I, I love this franchise. I love what it's built. I love what it stands for. Um... But to keep it on the level like it always been, to follow the tropes that it has created, the rules that it has created and lived by, if you're gonna reboot, let's 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 kind of poke a hole into the reboots and the legacy legacy sequels and stuff like that. And that's what it did, and it did it in such a fun way. Yes, the end kind of weird for me that was my only flaw with this film the end was so ridiculous how everybody was getting shot <laughs> you have you have uh 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 sydney prescott got shot about three times uh courtney cox got shot everybody was getting just getting just tore up from the floor up but they just walking around everybody was fine and <laughs> it was Okay, we get ridiculous here, but that's what this franchise is, you know. I got to, when I was sitting there watching it, the first time I watched it, I was like, ah, oh, man, this, this is getting ridiculous. And then, I, then it hit me like a ton of bricks. It, it's Scream. It's just, <laughs> it's Scream. It's supposed to be silly like that. And I, you know what? This is what it is, and I love it for what it is, because it doesn't apologize for what it is. Uh very smart love the reveal love the killer 
not going to spoil this one too much because it's so fresh. It's just a year old. Uh, but I can tell you, man, this was so smart. Um, some unexpected deaths, should I say? I mean, didn't see coming, and it was brutal. Very brutal. This is probably the bloodiest of the franchise. It's very bloody. Uh, but that's the this was done on purpose, you know, to to have that discussion, you know, about the elevated horror in the classic slasher, you know. So this is what it was all about. And this is why I enjoyed this film through and through. Uh other than the end with the <laughs> with with the uh characters being wounded beyond wounded sake, uh I really, really enjoyed it. And Scream from 2022 gets a letter grade of a B plus. Really enjoyed it. I enjoyed it so much. That's why I'm so excited for this upcoming addition to the franchise, Scream 6, which will be released today. Um, it's on March the 10th. Yeah, this is exciting. I'm I'm glad we're getting another one. Um if they keep doing it like this and find finding new innovative ways to continue this franchise without uh poking on poor little Sidney Prescott, who is not gonna be a part of this film, uh the the upcoming film, Scream Six, and that's because of a uh dispute between uh, Nev Campbell and Paramount Studios over pay. And I understand it. I get it. You know, she feels she deserves a a pay hike because at the end of the day, this is her franchise. She was there from the beginning all the way back in 1996. This this is her baby. She's been the star of them all. And uh, I don't know what the exact amounts or she was offered to be paid in this film franchise or this upcoming film, should I say? Uh, but if she was like the lowest on the totem pole, I, I, that is, that's a slap in the face. So I kind of get that, you know, she decided not to be a part of it. You know, I respect that, but, uh, I, I'm, I'm still going to check this out. I'm, I'm excited for it. I want to see what they're going to do. Can't wait, man. <laughs> Can't wait. This is going to be fun. Scream six will be released. Uh, this Friday in theaters um, should be an exciting time. How do you feel? Do are you a fan, a fan of this franchise? Like I am. Uh, do you feel they should have just stopped at two, three, or four, <laughs> whenever, <laughs> or at one? There's some, <laughs> some people that think they yeah, know what is enough. Uh, I would love to know how 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 much of a fan you are of this franchise. I I'm a huge fan. I, I love I love this. Um, I love how it turns a mirror on itself. Uh, I love uh, all movies that do that, you know, that can poke fun at themselves, yet tell a real good story. And they've done a excellent job of doing that throughout this franchise, even on the bad ones. Uh, <laughs> they know exactly who they are. Uh, you can contact this show by email. Just email me at kbradiopodcast at gmail.com. Also on the Twitters, you can just look up at KB Radio Network. And on any other social media platform, just look up the KB Radio Network. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, if you're watching slash listening on YouTube, (laughs) don't forget about the five stars, the reviews, sharing, and subscribing, if you will. Uh, it helps the show out tremendously. Everybody, thank you for joining me on this Scream edition of Movie Goodness. Can't wait to speak to you next week. Until then, everybody, I want you all to know that I love you. Continue to love one another. And until we speak again, you all be blessed.